So, it's been a few weeks and I am back. The problem with season one of the Wheel of Time TV show series is the plot and its themes. The plot is confusing. It's a contrived mystery following a bad choice of protagonist for a mystery. The show also seems to imply that men are inferior to women, or at least it focuses on the women to the exclusion of the men. Now, I'm putting an asterisk on seams because I can't tell if this is intentional or just circumstantial based on changes that the writers made to the lore, but it seems, again seems, as if they're changing the one power in order to make it non-binary or to make it so that it's not obviously separated into male and female halves. And although this might be a nice intention, it breaks the magic system and the plot of the books to do this, and it makes the story that the show is trying to convey really confusing. So stay with me because there's a lot to unpack here. First, I'm going to lean forward here just to make sure that you hear me. This video is not going to be a complaint about the TV show being woke trash or woke feminist trash or some kind of a representation of fourth wave feminism, whatever you think that means. I do have an opinion about that, like that whole concept of equating entertainment to political movements, but I'm not going to get into it right now, at least not in this video. In my opinion, diversity and inclusion are not the problems with this TV show. In a previous video, I covered the challenges of adapting an epic fantasy that is 14 books long into a television series that only allows eight episodes per season. That is also not the main problem with the show. It's also not the unexpected curveball that COVID-19 threw into the production or Barney Harris leaving after episode six. I want to be clear, those are challenges, but they are not the source of the problems that we are seeing with this adaptation. Adding more episodes is not gonna fix this story, definitely not for season one, and I think really not for subsequent seasons either. In another video, I also covered the characters, and although there are problems with the characters, there are problems, they are not the main problem. The characters are not the same as the characters in the books, but they do have the bones of individual personalities and glimmers of who the characters in the books become or could become in the TV show. What was done or really not done with the characters could be corrected in future seasons. We have good actors and people do evolve, characters do evolve. So there's some hope with the characterization for subsequent seasons. The problem with the TV show is that it changes the core of the story and particularly its lore to the point where I wonder why it was adapted at all. In order to understand this though, we have to start by breaking down the plot. So first I want to acknowledge that the TV show does have a plot structure. It's not just some willy-nilly hodgepodge of things that happen. It's building an understanding of the world of the Wheel of Time around three key concepts. One, the mystery of the dragon reborn. Two, that Aes Sedai are untrustworthy. And three, the fate of men who can channel. Now, these are not bad world-building concepts to focus on for the first season. There's a lot to cover, and what they do around this mostly works. People mostly understand it. <laughs> they are also, no surprises here, the original ideas that are from the book story that Robert Jordan created. I also don't hate the idea of making the first season more of an ensemble story than being a story about Rand told from his point of view. I think that the initial mystery of the Dragon Reborn is a potentially interesting way to tell the story because the camera does create distance and that distance can, and I think actually did in the case of the show, engage a viewing audience. They're all, you know, they're wondering who's the dragon, who's the dragon, at least for the first couple of episodes. And I think that that's not a bad change. However, it would have worked a lot better if it had only been the boys so as not to break the mechanics of the world and make a more confusing plot. I also don't think that the mystery angle should have been extended more than three or four episodes. I think it should have been 
fairly obvious who the Dragon Reborn is, or at least the strongest candidate for the Dragon Reborn, by the end of episode four. I also think that it's appropriate to establish that people in this world do not trust Aes Sedai. That's a theme from the books as well. Some of what the show does to establish that genuinely works, but it would have worked a lot better if Moiraine had not been presented as the protagonist of the story because she's also the detective working on solving this mystery and also the mentor of the Edmonds fielders. So it's weird to see her as somebody who can't be trusted if she's the main character and it's unwieldy that she seems to have so much lack of knowledge about her quest and no confidence in her ability to solve this mystery. Those were bad changes. So, you know, again, the, the mystery of the Dragon Reborn, yes. Throw in some uncertainty about the agenda of the Aes Sedai, great. Making Moraine the protagonist of the story in that situation, not, not so good. I also like the addition of Logan in this story. It's much more interesting to see what happens to men who can channel than just have people talk about it, especially through rumor, which is what happens in the books. In a television show, you don't have internals to work with, so instead we got scenes with Loghain, which were good additions. We got to see his fall from power and demonstrate the fate of a man who can channel, and especially men who claim that they are the Dragon Reborn. So. Focusing on that narrative to explore those ideas was mostly a good choice in terms of plotting. The adaptation had limited time, so they had limited ability to explore all of the concepts in the book and had to pick just a couple that would make the most sense to carry the story forward into future seasons. The problem is that these ideas, one, who is a dragon reborn, two, I said I can't be trusted, and three, men who channel go mad, those ideas by themselves are not a plot. At least it's not a plot if you don't understand the underlying structure of the magic system. Like, why do men go mad? Why are Sedai not trusted? Why are, is the dragon reborn this prophesied person? And the show seems to go out of its way to avoid explaining the magic system. Looking at it that way, the problem of the TV show is that it's not really telling a story. Instead, it's splicing these scenes together to communicate these three concepts, but it never explains why any of those concepts matter. The lore has been rewritten to such a degree in the story that it keeps tripping over itself trying to explain but not explain how the magic system works and both explain but not explain who the dragon was and who the dragon reborn is. And that is just really problematic for bringing an audience along into a story where there are a lot of strange concepts, where it's not earth and where you have to do a lot of foundational groundwork for the rest of the story to stand upon. The problem with the show is that it wants to keep the identity of the dragon reborn a mystery long past the point where that's useful as a storytelling device. It also makes who the dragon was a mystery, and when we do find out, it's so different from what happens in the books that it's unrecognizable. Instead of focusing on that, whatever, whatever it is they're trying to do there, the show weaves in some B plots to try to glue some semblance of a story together. So the B plots are Ran and Egwene's relationship, Lan and Nynaeve wanting to be together even though Lan is bonded to Moraine, and Matt's battle with the dagger sort of for what explanation we get of that, which is not much, <laughs> and a bit of Perrin having to choose between pacifism in the way of the leaf or something with the wolves which is not really explored either so you know that plot line as a b plot falls pretty flat too plus there's a little bit of the moiraine and a swan relationship with their undying but forbidden love and in my opinion that did not belong in the season at all not because i object to the relationship but because it just doesn't do anything for the story. It should be background characterization. 
in my opinion. It's not clear who this show is being made for because there are times when you have to have some knowledge of the books in order to fill in the gaps where logic of the story is not explaining things. And then there are other times where knowledge of the books interferes with understanding the story because of all of the changes they have made to the underlying lore and the magic system. Overall, this aspect of storytelling is not working. I have seen reactions by book fans, like hardcore book fans, people who have only read a few of the books, people who read the books a long time ago, and people who have no knowledge of the books whatsoever. And all of these audiences are confused about the core elements of the story in the TV show. Like, they might like the show anyway. Some of them, some of them really enjoyed watching it. The color palette alone is visual candy. The original ideas are great when they glimmer through the shroud that's obfuscating how the magic system works, but it's not a gripping tale holistically because the underlying foundation of what makes the story a story is not clear and the stakes are just as murky. Contrast this to the plot in the Wheel of Time books and you get a very different impression. So the books are structured around the prophecies of the Dragon Reborn and what this heralded individual is going to do to the world in which the story is set. So here's a snippet of the second stanza of the, of the Dragon Reborn prophecies. The shadow shall rise across the world and darken every land, even to the smallest corner, and there shall be neither light nor safety. And he who shall be born of the dawn, born of the maiden, according to prophecy, he shall stretch forth his hands to catch the shadow, and the world shall scream in the pain of salvation. All glory be to the creator and to the light and to he who shall be born again. May the light save us from him." So that's the prophecy. And what you get from this prophecy is that the dragon reborn is somebody who is going to, yes, save the world from darkness, but also destroy it. And if you read the whole Carathion cycle, the prophecies of the dragon, you'll see that the major plot points of all of the books are in there. You don't have to do this to understand the story. The whole poem is actually not in the books, but it's still the backbone of the story. The plot of the Wheel of Time book series is that the Dark One wants to control and in some ways destroy the pattern. The, the dragon is the champion of the light spun out by the wheel to stop the shadow. However, there can be no salvation without destruction. Luz Theron Telamon, the original dragon from the Age of Legends, is known in the Third Age as Luz Theron Kinslayer because he went mad, murdered his family, and broke the world, meaning he and his 100 companions literally tore apart continents using the One Power. The Dragon Reborn is prophesied to break the world again, which is why this prophecy is so feared. The dragon reborn must prepare the world for the last battle, and no one wants that to happen in their lifetime, and no one wants to be the dragon reborn. That is the core essential story that is being told by the Wheel of Time. But the Wheel of Time TV show doesn't explain this at all. It doesn't explicitly tell us what the prophecy is, who the dragon was, and what he did or what the Dragon Reborn is supposed to do. I actually watched all of the episodes again and took notes just to be sure here is the information that we actually get. Episode 1, Leave Takings. In the opening exposition, Moiraine tells us that men tried to cage darkness itself, the arrogance, and broke the world. The one who broke the world is called Dragon. There is no explanation of what broke the world means, and there is no mention that the dragon fought the shadow. At the end of the episode, Moraine says the dragon is the only one who can stand against the Dark One, but there isn't an explanation as to why or how. Then she says, the Trollocs are in the two rivers because the dragon has been born again and is one of the four Taviran for Taviran that live there, there's no explanation for Taviran. 
Their only chance, she says, is to reach the White Tower and the safety of the other sisters of the Aes Sedai. So right now at the end of episode one, the plot is to determine who is the dragon and to run away and find a place of safety. The Aes Sedai will know what to do. Episode two, Shadows Waiting. In episode two, the Edmonds Fielders, four of them right now, have a conversation and Matt says that the Dragon Reborn is supposed to be the most powerful channeler who has ever lived. Now, you'd think that would rule out Egwene as soon as Nynaeve's power level is shown in episode four, but it doesn't. They say that the last dragon broke the world, but the next dragon will save it. This is the opposite from the books, where the last dragon saved the world from the shadow in the Age of Legends, but when he comes again, he is prophesied to break the world. Moraine does say to forget what they've heard, but I have to assume that there is a core prophecy somewhere and that Moraine believes that prophecy to be true, or why else would she dedicate her life to this? We never see the prophecy or learn what it says beyond some vague notion that the dragon will either save the world or join the shadow as opposed to fighting the last battle and fulfilling a bunch of signs. Moiraine then pulls Egwene aside to teach her to channel and they cover the three oaths, which curiously doesn't include an exception for using the power against Shadowspawn. The point of this scene is that Moiraine thinks that Egwene can channel and therefore she might be the dragon, so she starts to train her. That's not me guessing what's going on in this scene. It is on the website. Go look, look it up at Amazon Prime Video and read the character description for Egwene. We are supposed to think throughout this entire story that Egwene's the most likely candidate to be the dragon. You might also note in that scene that there is no mention of being born with a spark or that channeling is dangerous to the untaught, and that's why Moiraine has to teach Egwene. There's also no mention of the true source having two halves, and that women channel Sadar, which is what happens in the book's version of that scene. This was the perfect opportunity to explain it, but instead we just get a mention of surrendering and metaphors to water, which weirdly implies that the gender essentialism still exists within the one power, at least for the female half, but it's just not explained and it's not very clear. This is also the episode where Moiraine drowns the ferryman. So the plot for this episode is that the Aes Sedai cannot be trusted. So first episode, who is the dragon? Let's go to the White Tower to be safe. Episode two, Egwene might be the dragon, but also we can't trust Aes Sedai because she just straight up murdered someone even though she gives a slippery answer as to why she can't kill and it, it falls pretty flat. And we know it's flat because Rand objects to it. Rand is the least trusting and demands to know what Moraine promised Egwene, which is supposed to be an indication, again, that Moraine thinks Egwene is the dragon and destined for glory or, or something like that. But Egwene doesn't answer him. This is also the episode where the Edmonds fielders, including Egwene, dream of Boazamon only they don't give him a name, it's just a scary face with embers. There's also a bat, and these dreams are not explained at any point in the season. It could be interpreted as them just having visions of the future rather than being visited by an actual entity. Bran tries to blame Moiraine for giving them the dreams, and her response is to tell them that dreams have power and then to give no other explanation. It's at this point that Rand demands to know what they're doing and what they're supposed to do at the White Tower if they actually manage to get there, especially the men. But Moraine just rides off without answering him and as we find out later, she has no actual plan. She was banking on the dragon being one of the women and Egwene in particular. So Rand and Egwene at this point in the story disagree about whether Aes Sedai are trustworthy even to the point of whether or not Moiraine is better than the shadow spawn that is chasing them, which seems a little, a little bit hyperbole. And then uh, they have this big fight and Rand comes off looking whiny and unnecessarily suspicious. 
and this is supposed to be our protagonist character to pull us forward into future seasons, so I don't know. This is also the episode where they get separated in Chatter Logoth. Episode 3, A Place of Safety. In episode 3, Dana, who is the dark friend, explains that she sees the Edmonds Field 4 in her dreams, but only one of them matters because only one of them is the dragon. Then she says, the last person to bring the dragon to the dark was Ishamayel 3,000 years ago. This is not explained and it makes no sense at all. Who or what is Ishamayel in this story? What do they mean that he brought the dragon successfully to the dark? That doesn't happen in the books. Also, what Dana says about only one of them mattering directly contradicts what Pod and Fane says later, and they presumably have the same lord, Dana and Pod and Fane, and are getting their orders from the same person, so what? Then, just to make things more convoluted, Dana says the Dark One is trying to save everyone, and that it's the Aes Sedai who are trying to destroy them. And from her perspective, breaking the Wheel of Time is a good thing because life has been a misery to her and she wants to stop being reborn. This goes right over the head of viewers who don't know enough about the premise of this world to understand what she is even talking about. It's also a philosophy that is really too advanced for the knowledge that this character has as a barmaid in some random rundown town. But anyway, the point of this episode is that everyone is now on their own, away from Aes Sedai, but they're not safe, so they still have to go to Tarvalon for safety and presumably also for answers. Episode 4, The Dragon Reborn. In episode 4, we learn about false dragons. I liked this addition because Loghain is a useful foil to understanding the Dragon Reborn, as I've already mentioned, and the fate that befalls men who can channel. Nynaeve shows that she is the most powerful channeler the world has seen in a thousand years, so Lorraine wonders if she was wrong about Egwene and that the Dragon Reborn is actually Nynaeve. Nynaeve does some out-of-character things in this episode, like killing people with knives, but overall it's a pretty good episode. It sets up Nynaeve to be a powerful character. However, that main plotline of who's the dragon is starting to fall apart at this point. It's, it's not helped by the <laughs> addition of a fifth candidate who is too old for the potential to be the dragon reborn and also makes Moraine look kind of stupid for assuming that it's her and not thinking that one of the three boys can channel. Like episode five, blood calls blood. In episode five, no part of the main plot progresses at all. Steppen's story is actually nicely written, but this episode doesn't have a purpose except as a vignette of a side character. In writing, we call this a darling. It's a lovely piece of fiction and the producer should have killed it. It doesn't serve the story. Episode six, The Flame of Tarvalin. In episode six, everyone arrives at their destination, Tarvalin, the heralded place of safety where they're all going to get answers. Except they don't get answers and they're not safe there. Almost as soon as everyone arrives, they immediately have to leave not because they're in direct danger, because Moraine has compromised her position of power within the White Tower and among the other Aes Sedai, and she has to get out of town because she is being sequestered by her fellow sisters due to some poor political maneuvering on her part. And I don't know, the whole politics of this episode are weird. More importantly in this episode, Moraine doubts her own knowledge of the prophecies that she has been studying for over 20 years. Moiraine wonders if the dragon could be split into multiple souls, which is needlessly convoluted. The fact that they even reference this means that the show might very well try to split the dragon's power in subsequent seasons instead of giving us the plotline of the books. Swan says that whether or not the dragon is one person or many, that the heart of the prophecy, this is where we're getting the prophecy, is still the same. The dragon will either fight the Dark One or join him. And that is not the prophecy of the Dragon Reborn in the books. Moraine says that she'll kill the Dragon Reborn rather than let him join the Shadow. Then Swan talks about her dreams. The Dark One is at the eye of the world, not Sheol Ghul. He is weak, 
barely clinging to his power but getting stronger every day. And she urges Moiraine to take the dragon candidate to the eye of the world because they have this potential opportunity to destroy the Dark One if they go right now. If this is true, there are no signs to fulfill in the prophecies and there's no last battle to prepare for. That's a prophesized thing because they're making it sound like it can be prevented by taking the Dragon Reborn candidate to the eye of the world and doing whatever the Dragon Reborn is supposed to do to prevent the prophecy from happening. Well, Moraine's only objection is that she doesn't know which of the Edmunds fielders is the Dragon Reborn and that whoever comes between the Dragon and the Dark One is going to die. Swan says she doesn't know that for sure, so Moraine says, okay, and decide to take everyone to the Eye of the World. Everyone rides out to this random hill where the Waygate is, and after they arrive, only after, there are some half-hearted objections to this plan. Nynaeve says, none of us will follow you blindly, not without answers to our questions. And Moraine answers, sort of. She says that the Eye of the World is where the Dark One was trapped by the last dragon at the cost of almost everything. This is the same dragon that supposedly went to the dark 3,000 years ago, according to Dana, so I don't, I don't know what this means. So we get that Luz there in Telamon is possibly a hero from Moraine's own lips at the end of episode 6, although the trap part is confusing for book readers since it's the Forsaken that were trapped in Sheol Ghoul, not the Dark One. Or in the books, the Dark One exists outside the pattern. He's not trapped in like a cave or something. <laughs> the boar that was made in the pattern allows him to touch the pattern directly, and the seals were used to close the boar. However, because they were only made with Sadine, the Dark One has been able to erode them over time. Again, that's from the books. In the show, Moiraine says that one of the Edmunds fielders will have to finish what they started in the Age of Legends, but what they started isn't clear, and neither is how they finish it. So, I don't know, the Dark One is trapped, but if they don't stop him from doing what, Trollocs will swarm across the land, the earth will burn, a new age will be built upon the ashes. Again, no reference is being made to the prophesized last battle in all of this. Moraine talks as if it can be prevented at this point in the story. But again, the Dark One is trapped, so only Egwene asks, what will happen to those who are not the Dragon Reborn? And Moraine doesn't answer her, so they all follow her blindly. Episode 7, The Dark Along the Ways. In Episode 7, Lord Aljamar makes an assumption that Moraine is there to help him defend Tarwin's Gap against the last battle, but he doesn't want help, which is the opposite from the books. Show Aljamar says Shinar can protect their own lands, and he blames his sister for making some kind of an emergency inquiry to the Aes Sedai without him knowing. This scene shows us another example of the arrogance of men, because Lord Aljamar's character is almost the opposite of this in the books. Then Moraine tells him that the Trollocs are using the ways and chastened. Aljamar says that the Borderlands have long respected the White Tower, which, you know, goes against everything that he just said in this scene. So, whatever. Moraine goes to see Min to see if the seer, the seer, can spot the Dragon Reborn. Moraine tells the Edmunds fielders, at least the ones that are with her since Matt's not there, that Min doesn't know who the Dragon Reborn is and reiterates that anyone who goes to this confrontation with the Dark One at the Eye of the World is going to be crushed to, into oblivion between two powerful forces. Then we learn that, oh, surprise, Ran can channel and he knows he can channel. This takes about five seconds of the show's time to actually reveal, which is a little bit underwhelming for how much time was spent on other things earlier in the season. Also, Min sees that Rand is the Dragon Reborn and confirms that it is him so that there's no doubt, I guess, since they made this change so rapidly. This made me wonder if Min should have been their destination from the beginning rather than Tarvalin, since they actually gained nothing by going there. As an aside, if they had wanted to keep Tarvalin as the destination in season one instead of Camelin, because they don't have a budget to make both Camelin and Tarvalin, they could have placed Min in Tarvalin 
and made the objective to get to her in order to confirm which of the people is the dragon reborn based on Moraine's suspicions. Then the politics among the Aes Sedai could have played like a side story in that destination in order to get them to leave Tarvalin because of what they would potentially do to the real dragon reborn if he was reborn within their lifetime, and this could spur Moiraine to escape with everyone. They could even have had Min tell Moiraine about the Eye of the World as opposed to Swan, because that would have been more centric to the story, and it would have avoided all of that nonsense we had about Moiraine needing to be sequestered in the tower for some reason, and trusting the Amarillin's dreams after telling everyone else in episode two not to trust dreams. Just, I don't know, I did not like episode six. I thought it had some interesting direction. I love the costumes, but the plot was just meh. <laughs> Finally, we have episode eight, and I'm sorry to rehash this in detail since I already made a whole episode on episode eight, but man, this is the episode where the plot's supposed to come together. We're supposed to get all of the reveals and it's a doozy, but not in a good way. So in the cold open, Luz Theron Telamon accuses Latra, the Tamerlan in the Age of Legends, in this version of the story, that she wants to break the Aes Sedai into two. Think about that. Then she accuses him of wanting to break the Aes Sedai into two. So the implication here is that the Aes Sedai were one body potentially with only one power between them, before Luz Theron Telamon tried to quote-unquote cage the Dark One. And Latra tells him that his pride will expose the one power to the Dark One, and that doing so will make it so potent that they could destroy the world and set humanity back a thousand years or more. So, okay, so the Dark One could make channelers more powerful powerful. Is that what the taint is? Again, in this version of the story, I'm not sure. Okay, so this conversation also implies that there is not a boar in the pattern, that the Dark One has always existed, that he exists in the world. His darkness or some kind of darkness is a necessary part of balance, and it's Luz Theron Telamon's hubris to quote-unquote Cade darkness itself, again, the arrogance that led to the breaking of the world, the taint on Seabane, and is essentially the reason that the future timeline is terrible and is the villain of the story. So Luz Theron Telamon's arrogance is a preemptive attack rather than a resistance in the show's version of events, I think. He started the War of Power. Maybe the Dark One split the One Power as his counterstrike, thereby tainting only the men who try to touch it. All right, that, that's a lot to absorb, and I, I'm not sure that's right because the storyline is so different from the books and also so unclear but that is possibly what's going on. I say possibly because I'm really just not sure. Sadine is mentioned in the old tongue in that conversation, but it's translated as one power. So after eight episodes, I'm still not sure if there are two halves of the true source and if they exist in the same way in the show that they do in the books. Part of the reason I'm not sure is because there's so many mistakes in the show. There's so many continuity problems. There's so much like bad editing and bad writing that I don't know if the magic system is consistent in what the writers are using to tell the story. It's possible that they have some kind of a consultant that comes onto the set to do the old tongue pieces and that person is like, yeah, Sadine throws it in there, and then in the editing, the showrunners go, oh, no, no, in this version of the story, Sadine can't exist. Let's retranslate that one power. And I don't know. It's, it's possible just because of other things that happen, like Lan teleporting out of the uh, little house where he's having a meal to appear randomly in the street beside Nynaeve. And just the problem with the link circle burning out Nynaeve and Egwene at the end of the story. So many continuity problems, so many things that contradict the books that 
I just don't know what's going on. The foundations are just so unclear. I can't tell what, how the magic system works. But anyway, Latra accurately predicts disaster for whatever it is that Luther and Telamon is trying to do. She tells him that the whole world is going to burn if he does this thing, but then she doesn't try to stop him doing it. She's just like, okay, I'm your friend. I'm going to tell you you're making a mistake, but if you want to go do this, go, go ahead. It's fine. And so he does. He goes forward with his plan to cage darkness in order to make the world safe for his baby, I guess, even though we're then shown outside his window that the world looks really safe already, which is why I think that maybe there's not a role for power and there isn't a bore. But again, this could just be bad writing and bad editing. I'm, I'm honestly not sure. So anyway, this has been covered extensively, in, including by me, but this whole cold open and really the whole episode eight is such a hot mess. It clarifies nothing. I don't have any idea what happened in the Age of Legends in the show's version of the story, except that it is not what happened in the books. It's also really unclear what the current prophecy is or what Moiraine's plan is. Swan told her that the Dark One is weak and that's why they have to go to the Eye to confront him. But then in the Blight, Moiraine tells Rand that the Blight is growing because the Dark One is getting stronger. So which is it? And then she gives Rand this song, Rial, that's supposed to contain the power of thousands of male channelers. This song, Rial, is easily portable, which seems problematic because it would be easily stealable. And she tells Rand that he's supposed to do something. <laughs> Rand actually asks her, what am I supposed to do? And Moraine says he's supposed to, quote unquote, put the Dark One back where he belongs where he can't touch the earth for another 3,000 years. So wait, isn't that exactly what Latra scolded Luz Theron Telamon for trying to do? To try to cage darkness or put it back in its place? And also what Moiraine says at the beginning of the show was the arrogance of men that caused the breaking. Do you see what I'm saying? This is the foundation of the story and I don't understand it. And neither does anyone I have seen watch and react to the show, both book fans and non-book fans. I, I know it's different from the books and that's about all I know. Also, how is Rand supposed to accomplish this? Whatever it is. Moiraine says the power will come to him in a crisis and you know, people in the Wheel of Time books do occasionally do things by instinct. The more powerful the channeler, the more likely they are to like invent some kind of a new weave on the fly and then figure out what they did later. But replacing instinct with abuse seems like an odd choice to make as a mechanism for growth especially when the stakes are so high and the real fear is that the dragon reborn might turn to the dark. But anyway, in the blight, Rand has a dream. The dark one appears and he is some guy wearing an outfit similar to what Latra wore in the cold opens, like some kind of religious garb, but undefined. And he tells Rand that only he can tell him what being the dragon really means, that there's a secret to it. Rand doesn't want to listen. He kills himself in the dream before he can learn about what that is. And at the actual eye of the world, Rand has a bunch of memories, which you would think would be strange since we are told in episode one that people don't remember their past lives, but neither Rand nor Moiraine remark on this as being unique to the dragon reborn or an advantage or anything like that. Rand is then thrown into this dream where he's Egwene's husband and they have a baby named Joya. Ishamayel, who's the name of the character that in the credits is listed as this Dark One character, maybe sort of steals Moraine, but does it do anything to stop her using a knife on Rand? Which, like, why? Okay. Uh, also, she is not, you know, crushed between two powerful forces, so she got that wrong. And it should be obvious to her, at least I would think, that this man who is so imposing in this place is not the dark one, that this is a man who can channel, but she doesn't seem surprised or aware of this, or at least I can't tell whether or not she knows that this person is not a negative dark energy entity, but is just a person who perhaps is one of the forsaken who serves the dark one. Anyway, 
In the dream, Ishamayel tells Rand that he can show him how to use his own power to remake the world in his image. In the real world, Moraine tells this person, who we, again, we don't know if she knows who he is, that he can't escape this place on his own. And I had to pause and reflect, what, what does that mean? Like, if she thinks that this guy is the dark one, that would imply that they didn't need to come to the eye of the world at all, because if the dark one is trapped and he can't escape on his own, then why are they even there? Remember in episode seven, Moraine told the group that the dark one was trapped by the last dragon at the cost of almost anything. Now she's at the eye and she's telling him that he is trapped and can't escape on his own. So what is it that the dragon reborn has to finish doing? Like what was the point of going to the eye of the world? What does she mean when she tells Rand that he needs to put the dragon back where he belongs for the next 3,000 years. Like, none of none of this makes sense. It's contradicting itself in story for what it is that the characters are trying to do. You know, did, did Moraine bring Rand there to release this guy, to trap this guy, to have some kind of a philosophical confrontation which would do something? Does he do that by choosing freedom for the people by choosing the dark by using the one power since she gives him that song reel it's just it's so unclear but anyway we can just you know skip over these foundations because the real story is apparently Rand's a relationship with Egwene in the dream world Rand doesn't doesn't choose he doesn't choose to remake the world because he loves Egwene and he wants her to be free and to be Aes Sedai or wisdom or whatever it is that she wants to do rather than be a wife and mother or whatever it is that he wants her to do. So he rejects Ishamayel's offer, and with this little burst of light, he vanquishes him. Except not really. It also looks so, so weak. Remember in episode two, we learned that the dragon is supposed to be the most powerful channeler ever. And then Moiraine says that the Sangriel will increase his power a thousandfold, but when he actually uses this Sa'angriel, it seems way less impressive than anything that Moiraine does in the first episode or anything that Nynaeve does in episode four. So I don't know, whatever. Rand thinks that he kills the guy, even though he's smiling as he vanishes. <sighs> I'll also point out that Rand's shining moment in the book when he defeats the armies at Tarwin's Gap is given to Amalisa instead when she's channeling in this linked circle with Nynaeve and Egwene. Amalisa dies and Nynaeve is burned out, I think, which shouldn't be possible when linked, which again makes us wonder, did the writers read the books? I don't know. Back at Feldara, Paladin Fane reveals to Perrin what Taviran are, finally in episode eight after one mention in episode one. And he says that Taviran are focal points of the wheel. Remember the pattern has never been mentioned like at any point in this entire story. He says the Trollocs were sent to bring the Taviran to his Lord. And he says that the world needs the dark, that the world needs balance and some of them will turn to the shadow, maybe all of them. At the eye, Moraine says that they can't go back to Faldara while looking at this broken sort of yin-yang symbol beneath her feet, and Rand announces that he's never going back. And Moraine just lets him go, without explaining what it is that she meant about how, why they can't go back to Faldara and what it is like what the significance is of the, I assume, seal on, on something. I don't know if it's the Dark One's prison, but seal on something. Pod and Fane says it's not the end, it's Perrin, that it's the beginning. And he tells Perrin that picking up a weapon means he's choosing the dark, I guess. And then he walks off with the Horn of Valir, which, you know, is a mystery object that has not been mentioned before this episode. He walks off with this horn, leaving Perrin, who he just told in the previous scene that he was been chasing this whole time, along with the other Taviran, and specifically that it wasn't just the Dragon Reborn, that the Dark wanted all of them. So why did he leave Perrin there, exactly? Then Lan shows up at the Eye of the World, and he seems just fine, 
even though more rain has been stilled or whatever, the showrunners, I, I think in Brandon Sanderson has also said that she's been stilled or we're supposed to believe that. Perrin is then shown gazing onto the battlefield where he did absolutely nothing. Nynaeve looks like she's been dead for hours, but Egwene manages to resurrect her with this little like baby tendril of the one power and, and the sadness of her tears. And then Rand climbs the hill and heads off somewhere for some reason. Moraine identifies the rocks beneath her feet as Quaindiar, and this is what she says specifically. She says, it can't be broken, but we clearly see it's broken. And then she says, <laughs> she says, this isn't the last battle. She does not explain that the Quaindiar is a seal on the Dark One's prison or to the Forsaken or anything. She just says, it can't be broken. She doesn't explain what Quaindiar is. She doesn't explain how it can't be destroyed by the One Power, which we clearly see Rand destroying it with the One Power. She just says, this isn't the last battle, as if now suddenly the last battle is some kind of prophesized thing that has to happen or, you know, can't be prevented or could have been prevented as was implied in episodes six and seven. So yeah, I don't know. There's no explanation. It just ends there. Uh, so, you know, we have to ask these questions. How did Rand break this rock that can't be broken? Can Queen DR be broken with the one power or not? If this is a seal, what is it sealing? Did Rand break like Ishamael's chains or break him out of prison instead of the Dark One? Again, I've read the books. I understand how this works in the books, but the show is doing something different. I'm just not sure what because nothing is explained. So I'm trying to figure out like, what happened in that scene? Why did Ishamayel smile? Did he somehow become free as a result of Rand making this choice that Egwene should be free after all? Was that Rand choosing the dark in some way that I haven't understood yet? Like, does this seem nonsensical to anybody else? <laughs> I just, I can't tell you. I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. So, you know, I, I really can't get it as somebody who read the books, but I imagine that the people who watch the show have even less of an idea of what's going on because they can't even guess at the mechanisms that are going on here. They never heard the word Queen DR. They don't know what the seals are. They don't know who Ashamayel is. Never heard of the Forsaken. Like nothing on the in the scene makes any sense at all, other than we're told Rand defeated the Dark One, except not really. And that's just that is not a gripping story. That's not that interesting. All right, so then finally we get this epilogue scene where the Swanshen throw a tidal wave at this little girl standing on the beach, and that is the end of season one of The Wheel of Time. In, in watching this whole show again and taking notes on what we do and do not know about the Dragon Reborn and the central conflict of the story, it is clear that there has been a utter rewrite of the underpinning mechanisms that inform the source material. The magic system is not the same. The themes are not the same. The battle between light and dark is not the same. What the Dragon Reborn is supposed to do is not the same. It's also nonsensical as its own thing, at least in places, especially in that last episode. You know, th there may be some explanation like in the future about what these characters are trying to do in subsequent seasons, but it's obfuscated and shrouded in doubt to the point that the stakes just become incomprehensible. And I think that the showrunners, the writers who are who are working on this don't have a shared understanding about how this world works. And it doesn't really seem like they care if it makes logical sense or not. I think they're just kind of focusing on moments of like pop and glitz and battle scenes and don't really understand what makes an epic fantasy story epic because it's not those things. It's the themes and the cohesion and the fight between good and evil. And I just, hmm, <laughs> the story just doesn't cover all, any of that. I think all people really pick up on is that the Dragon Reborn must face this Dark One character that's not very well explained and that Rand loves Egwene and, you know, they're not even the hero couple of the story, so not that interesting or original of a story if you're if that's all you're taking from it. So the question becomes, why? 
why were these changes made? Why did the showrunner, Rafe Judkins in particular, and the rest of the team involved decide that this version of the story, that these changes to the world would be better for a television audience than what is presented in the books, much more coherently by the author of the original story? An explanation that I don't buy is that the story needed to be shortened to tell it for TV. Like, yes, it does, but not in this way, especially not in the first season. Like, just to see if it was possible, I plotted the entirety of The Eye of the World into an eight-episode season outline. I even kept the parts where they focus on Loghain and the Aes Sedai politics, and it fits. It wasn't that hard. In fact, it might be the easiest book to fit into that structure, especially if you remove that useless episode in the middle of the story that doesn't progress anything. So I don't want to give any credit to this excuse that the changes made to the story in the first season was because there wasn't time to tell the original story. I don't, I just do not believe that. Here's what Rafe Judkins had to say about it though. He says, there's lots of stuff that we've set up in season one that are changes from the books that we needed to make for later payoffs. That quote comes from a Twitter Q&A with him, which was transcribed to the website winteriscoming.net. And oh, okay, yes, things need to be changed for later payoffs, but I don't believe the changes they made to this season can or will result in any meaningful payoff later. Yes, the show is always going to tell a story differently than the way it is told in the books, but the lack of time does not explain the changes that were made to the lore. I think those changes were made for a different reason. In that same interview, Rafe Dudkin says that he expected the show would lose the hardcore fans. Here's exactly what he says. So we always imagined that we'd likely lose absolute hardcore book fans who've read the book series multiple times because the show would be too different from the books. And conversely, that we'd lose people who'd never watched a fantasy show because it's too much like the books, which are very high fantasy. The target has always more been people who read some or all of the Wheel of Time years ago or are not fantasy genre fans I'm sorry, or are fantasy genre fans but are not familiar with Wheel, which is a huge breadth of people. The shocking thing to me is how many really, really Sarah Nakamura level hardcore book fans have loved the show despite the departures and how many people who have never watched a fantasy show before in their lives are somehow finding their way to this one and loving it too. So. I don't, I don't know how to take this. Yes, lots of people have watched the show, but I don't think the show is capturing a less hardcore audience by deviating from the books the way that is suggested in this interview. I think Rafe underestimates how many hardcore book fans there are, how many people have actually read the story, and why the story has so many fans. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes has dropped to the low 60s for the show after the airing of that final episode. There were a lot of people who were hoping and expecting that the show was going to right the ship in that last episode, and it didn't. Critic score has remained at 82, but that's because the show has had a really competent PR strategy, and maybe that's Rafe's real skill. I don't know. I mean, he was a Survivor contestant, so perhaps controlling perception is his thing, more so than actually delivering a good product. I don't want to make assumptions about the guy. I just, I see a lot of talk from him about what a big fan of these books he is, but I don't see it coming through in the show. He's changed a lot of the core ideas of what made the books popular. What I see is a guy who has been in the media a lot, who has been building a brand for himself, stringing along book fans of this really popular series by giving them cagey explanations about why he completely overhauled a very popular story without actually explaining what he changed and why he made those changes. I also find it a little bit odd how little information I have been able to find about Rafe Judkins, considering that he is the showrunner for such a popular franchise. 
I've read, you know, again for interviews that he has broken three copies of the first three books because he loved them so much. And I know that he's written a few scripts for the show Chuck, which is not a show that I've seen, as well as a few episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the first two seasons, which is a, se a series that I've seen. And I don't know what he did between 2014 and being the producer of the Wheel of Time TV series, there seems to be a gap where he was, you know, presumably doing something, maybe taking some R and R. I don't know. But I, what I do know is that he says that he's a fan, but it's hard to believe him when so much of what the show presents doesn't get the basic mechanisms of the world right. It seems that he either is less of a fan than he pretends remembers less than he claims or dislikes the core story more than he lets on. Rafe wrote episodes one and episodes eight of the Wheel of Time TV show, which are arguably the worst episodes of the bunch. Episode eight definitely is. Episode one could suffer just from being the first episode. It has to carry a lot of ideas, but you know, I've also read the original leak script for that episode, and it's terrible. Like the there's so there are so many more vivid sex scenes in the original script, as well as animal sacrifices that they introduce as part of Egwene's ritual to come to the women's circle. You can read it online. It's it's something that Robert Jordan would have hated. I mean, he has explicitly stated that he is not a fan of, of erotica within his world, like with his characters. Like he's actually sued people for publishing erotica involving his characters. And after reading the original script that Rafe wrote and understanding what it was that Robert Jordan thought and felt about his own series, I don't think they would have gotten along, and I don't think that Robert Jordan would ever have greenlit this series being produced. So I, I don't know. I compare that reality to quotes from interviews like this one about why Rafe made the changes he made. <clears throat> Quote, we haven't done them for shock value or because we felt like we needed to change the books, he says, but changes needed to be made to make the adaptation work. I, I look at this and something just feels off. I mean, to be honest, this just seems like a straight up lie, like a lie to the book fans in order to, you know, get them to come along on this journey so that he can get all the views. There's this rumor that Rafe wanted Moiraine to kill the fairy man with lightning in episode two. And, but I can't find the evidence. If, if you have the evidence, you can put it in the comments, but if true, something like that would show that he does not understand the basic tenants of the story. Like, he doesn't know how the three oaths work. I did see a AMA with him on Reddit where he jokes, was it a joke? Um, about the writers having suggested that Perrin should talk to bears, or where he seems to think it would be funny to mess with Sarah Nakamura, the book fan consultant on the show, giving her busy work and trying to quote unquote break her down with suggestions like, what would be the implications if we wrote Tom out of the show or we killed Tom off in the story and then having her compile all of this information to explain to him why that's a bad idea and then joking, oh, no, we were actually not going to do that after the fact as if it's like amusing to, to make people spin around and do a bunch of work to try to satisfy some whim that you have. Half the writers I've heard have never read the books, and apparently that's by design. And, you know, I don't know, you hear these things and you just have to question, like, why are these people wanting to adapt this story? Now, I do recognize that an artist has the right to reinterpret something and make it their own when they are creating something new, even if it's from something that already exists. But this remake just isn't good. It's not even average. It I would rate the whole show at, at a high, <laughs> as a six out of 10 at best, and lower if you're just going off of episode eight. And I think a lot of points that it gets for me are not having to do with the writing at all. It's things like the actors and the cinematography and the costume designs. And just the fact that it's like kind of sort of sometimes wheel of time. I do recognize that Amazon bought the rights to the story and they can do whatever they want with it. But 
man, people are disappointed. They're disappointed because this is the first and very likely only adaptation that this story will ever get. So why are they butchering it so much? Why didn't they pick some other story if they were going to change the core ideas this much? If they aren't fans, what is their passion? Like, what is the agenda? What is it that they're trying to do? And here's where we have to talk about themes and whether or not the Wheel of Time TV show was <sighs> rewritten to be some kind of woke feminist trash. And again, I'm, I, I personally do not like that framing. I think it is intentionally and inherently confusing as well as deliberately dividing to call entertainment woke in a deris derisive way. And I, I need to spend more time elaborating on that and explaining why I think that is, but I have to point that to their video because there's just not time to do it here. There's just so much to unpack around this. I will say this in summary though, my concern about the Wheel of Time TV show is that the writers are coming off, can't say if they actually are or not, but they are coming off as a misandrist or man-hating, that they are, they are not coming off as feminist and inclusive. They're just coming off as bad writers who are sidelining the male characters for maybe some kind of an agenda or attention grab, which is a disservice to the original source material and the themes of gender equality that Robert Jordan so painstakingly crafted when he wrote the book. So ultimately I find the Wheel of Time TV show to be disrespectful to the source material, but especially to its themes of gender equality, which although not perfect, are better than what this show is presenting. We'll have to, you'll have to wait until my next video to, you know, really dig in to why this is a problem and how it was presented. But if you want to help clarify how this is making you feel, please put that in the comments. Just be really civil about it. Tell me how the story makes you feel specifically. Tell me why it made you feel that way. What specific moments made you connect some ideas together for what the show is trying to do. Tell me how the role of the characters that the males play particularly affected you. Let me know how you think masculinity is represented in the show, if at all. I, think I could argue that it's not there, but to me, it, it feels at best to be a show that is sidelining the positive attributes of men and masculinity in order to elevate the female characters and their roles in the story, sometimes without really any positive payoff. And I just don't know why. If you have evidence from the showrunners being explicit about the changes to the world, to the magic system, to the characters, to you know why they made other creative decisions that they made, please put those in the comments, but just note that I want direct quotes. I want words straight from the lips of people who have worked on this production or worked with people on this production, like links to interviews, AMAs, specific tweets. To date, my biggest disappointment with the show is just that the PR buttered up the fan base to expect something more faithful to the books than it ended up being. I would have probably just not watched it if I had known that it was going to be this far off from the original story. I was told that the writers and the producers were fans of the books and that was exciting. Just look at this quote from Rafe Judkins before the production aired. I just felt like the worst thing I could ever see is knowing that these books are going to be adapted and that I let someone else do it who didn't know them and didn't care about it and they created something that really doesn't honor what's there. Rape Judkins, showrunner, I pulled that from an article published to Radio Times, and I just look at this and I think, really? You think, you think what you created honored the original source material? Now that I've actually seen it, I'm questioning whether Rafe cares about the books of the original source material, or, or maybe if he understood them or didn't understand them, maybe he doesn't agree with the messages in the books, or, 
I don't know, maybe he's looking to leverage their popularity for some personal reason. I, I don't know. I don't know. And I, I honestly hope that I'm wrong because I would like the future seasons of the show to course correct and do a better job of telling the story that's in the books and particularly along the themes of gender equality. But again, I'm going to have to get into that in more detail in a separate video. So sorry. Until next time.